Hello, my name is Alicia Goodman with the marketing team. Welcome to Digital Learning Strategies with Mike Fisher, part of the ASCD Summer Boot Camp webinar series on classroom technology. This webinar is brought to you by Adobe Presenter. The all-new Adobe Presenter 10 enables educators anywhere to flip learning. You can easily create video lectures from your desktop, share course materials with students, and track learner progress without investing in an LMS. Find out more at www.adobe.go/flipclass. And now, a brief introduction to our presenter. Mike Fisher is an instructional coach and education consultant specializing in the intersection between instructional technology and curriculum design. He works with districts across the country, helping teachers and schools maximize available technology, software, and web-based resources while attending to curriculum design, instructional practices, and assessments. He posts frequently to the ASCD Edge social networking platform, the Curriculum 21 blog, and his own blog. ASCD is pleased to welcome Mike Fisher. Thank you very much, Alicia. Um, <clears throat> welcome to Digital Learning Strategies, How Do I Assign and Assess 21st Century Work? Um, I'm Mike Fisher. Um, I'm uh, here with you for the next hour to talk about the ARIA, the book, um, Digital Learning Strategies. And to tell you some of the um, examples that I've come across uh, in the field and some of the things that are in the book and some of the ways that I uh, challenge the thinking of others around digital tools in the classroom. And I thank you very much for spending your afternoon with me on uh, this nice summer day. I hope it's nice where you are. Um, but <clears throat> we're going to get right down to business. I'd like to encourage you to uh, ask questions uh, during the webinar. Uh, Alicia is going to jump in and tell me if we have questions, and um, I'll try to address those in the moment. Additionally, we're going to save some time at the end for uh, additional questions. So, without further ado, let's jump right in. Um, in a blog post a year and a half ago, um, I wrote about this notion of technology integration and um, what it really means in classrooms. And I think that technology integration is uh, not necessarily the best way to think about um, technology in schools anymore. We need to start thinking about it in a different way. When we think about technology integration, um, we're still looking largely at technology being an event, like Computer Lab Thursdays or checking out the laptop cart, where the technology is 100 percent directed by the teacher or by the resource, the amount of time that you might have with a particular resource. And I realize that some of that is dependent upon the resources that you have. Um, but it's still, you know, we're 14 years into the, the 21st century, so I think we need to be looking at it in terms of uh, going a little deeper. The next level, then, um, I'm calling infusion. It's a little bit deeper than uh, integration, where the tech is more readily av available. This is happening in a lot of our schools, uh, where you know, we're having one-to-one -one laptop initiatives or iPad initiatives or other devices um, or cell phones are available uh, to students during the day. And the use of those things uh, is still pretty much driven uh, by the teacher, although the students may have uh, some limited choices. But what I'm looking for is immersion. And immersion is where multiple technologies are readily available. The usage of them is primarily at the discretion of the student. And they're, they're a choice, like using paper or using a pencil. Um, it's just always there. It's always available so that students can choose it uh, whenever it's the right time to use it. So I'm challenging you today to try to start thinking immersive. And what I mean by that, I'm not saying immersively, uh, the adverb, to describe how I want you to think. I'm describing an environment. I'm describing what immersive technology would look like as an environment, like water would be to a fish, uh, or the force to Luke Skywalker, I think I said in the book. Um, <clears throat> we're looking for you know, something that I'm, I'm, I'm writing about it now, and I'll publish it to ASCDH in the next couple of weeks. but. Um, I've been toying with this idea of technology homeostasis, and uh, word, the word that I'm coining is technomeostasis. 
We want the world that the kids live in outside of school in terms of technology and the amount of information that they're interacting with and the number of people that they're interacting with. Um, we want that to be the same inside of school as it is outside of school. Um, and so that there's a balance in, in the way that um, we're dealing with technology. And it has to be that way. We're, like I said, we're 14 years into the 21st century. We can't prepare for the 21st century anymore because we're in it. Um, <clears throat> so I want to I want to just tell you what you're participating in right now is a good example of immersion. I'm using multiple tools that are in my toolbox to share this learning opportunity with you right now. Um, Adobe Presenter is being used as the vehicle uh, for sharing the information. I'm using presentation software within that. Um, I'm going to be showing you uh, several Web 2.0 tools and some documents. I'm taking all of these different things, pulling them from my toolbox to create an immersive digital environment right here, right now, with you. And we want to be able to give um, students these opportunities as, as well. I made all the choices here about what I was going to do and the message that I was going to um, give to you. And this is what leveraging a toolbox looks like. I made strategic choices based on the tools, but as directed by the task. We're exploring digital learning strategies. I'm not here today just to show you uh, how awesome Live Binders is or how awesome Prezi is. I'm here to talk about task-specific decisions um, using and leveraging some of these really cool tools that we have. It's not about the tool. It's about the task. <clears throat> I'm both sharing and modeling what's possible here. You and your students can do the same. Now, periodically, I'm going to be asking you to think about um, the things that I'm saying. And I, I'm going to say a couple of provocative things. And I want you to um, do something that I used to do with my students when I was still in the classroom. And that's something called notice, think, and wonder, these visible thinking routines from uh, Harvard's Project Zero that I've used for years. Um, but when you notice, um, we're looking for the things that are jumping out at you as important information to know. Uh, when we think about our learning, what connections are you making to previous learning or observations uh, that you've made uh, educationally or with your own students? And then the wonder question is just what questions do you have about the implications of what I'm sharing? So I'd like to challenge you uh, to notice, think, and wonder while we're going through this together today. Um, so I want to go to uh, the book a little and talk about uh, six steps uh, for deciding when it would be a good idea uh, to, to assign digital work, to think about uh, replacement behaviors. Because all of this really is boiling down to curriculum and what it is that we're doing uh, in, in terms of upgrading either the instructional activity uh, or the assessment, how kids are demonstrating their learning. And before I go into the six steps here, I want to talk about my grandfather, Alonzo McDaniel, for just a moment. Um, last summer, my grandfather gave my brother and me uh, some of my great-grandfather's tools, tools that he used back in the late 1800s, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to build furniture that my family still has. And one of the tools that my grandfather gave me was this old drill. And the drill uh, looked like a, like a kitchen mixer, like a whisk. <coughs> Excuse me. And it was, it was rusted. There was a, um, a package of drill bits that went with it. And I, it, I thought it was really cool that he gave that to me. I've got something that belonged to my great-grandfather. But, you know, my electric drill is a lot more efficient and does the job a lot faster, although the task has not changed. Being able to drill a hole or being able to put a screw in tightly, um, that task has not changed. The tool with which I will do that action has. And I'm leveraging innovation to make what I do faster and more efficient. And that's what we're looking for when we're thinking about um, digital replacements. I've said in other webinars, I've said it in uh, professional development that I've done. I quoted a, um, a guy named Perry Marshall in the book that said, 
if you've ever gone to a hardware store to buy a drill, you didn't go because you wanted a drill. You went because you wanted a hole. Let that sink in for just a moment. The task absolutely is what matters here. So when we're thinking about designing curriculum around all these digital tools, we absolutely have to be laser focused on the task, on the learning objective. And that brings us to step number one. What is the learning objective? What instructional task have you designed in the past to meet the objectives? What choices will students have to demonstrate their learning? Um, we, we always want to be coming back to whatever this learning objective is and then making some decisions about the ways to meet that learning objective. When we get to step number two, we're looking to see if the task is worthy of a digital upgrade. Is the digital tool going to enhance the learning, and if so, in what ways? We don't just want a whole bunch of worksheets on an iPad. Um, automating is not what we want. What I mean by automating, it's a term from Alan November uh, from one of his books um, about how we bolt technology onto an already in place practice, for instance. Um, teachers who get a smart board, uh, but then they just project things on it. They never use its interactive capabilities or its presentation capabilities or let the students use it um, as, as an innovative tool for learning. It's being used the exact same way as the Blackboard was used, so it's just the new Blackboard. The third step is looking to see if the digital tools are going to increase or decrease the cognitive rigor of the task. We want to up the thinking game here. Uh, we don't want to just make it easier for the sake of using technology for you know, speed and efficiency. We also want to change some of the thinking that's going on. And in terms of that, um, kids are going to have to learn additional skills when using digital tools, and that might help them be better discerners of tools that are in their toolbox. But the additional question here is what other skills might have to be considered in order to engage this upgrade. Um, this comes up a lot in conversations about the Common Core. Those of you that are in the United States know that we have a new uh, system of standards here called the Common Core Standards, but this is analogous to standards in every part of the world, no matter where you're from, uh, in terms of how we think about um, thinking and how the standards sophisticate over time. And Norman Webb's depth of knowledge addresses this uh, the same way that the six levels of Bloom's taxonomy does. Uh, Norman Webb's depth of knowledge does this in four levels. Those levels are recall, application, strategic thinking, and extended thinking. Um, in strategic thinking, we're asking kids to stretch. And we want to make sure that we're stretching them when we use digital tools. Step number four. Does the digital upgrade involve collaboration, communication, creative problem solving, and or creative thinking? And then how will students engage in these skills? These are the four primary 21st century skills, and they, they've been taken directly from the p21.org website. And actually, Alicia, if you wouldn't mind putting p21.org in the chat box uh, for the participants to um, visit that site when the webinar is over. Um, or now and come back. <laughs> um, but these are, the, these are the primary 21st century skills that we want to address with our students. Note that the word computer is not one of these skills. The computer is a tool to make these skills uh, work better, work faster, more efficient. Uh, but we still want to have opportunities uh, in the learning process for students to collaborate with each other, be able to communicate their ideas, solve problems creatively with their own toolboxes, and think critically about the decisions that they're making and the tools that they're using. Step number five is all about equity. Um, are sufficient digital tools available, and do students have access to them? Uh, what I ask teachers to consider in, in, in districts is, you know, how are you leveraging uh, your current resources? Do students have access after school? Are there teachers taking turns to maybe man the computer lab so that students can uh, have access if they don't have it at home? Are you partnering with uh, the local libraries um, or other places that might give the kids uh, digital access um, outside of school? The last step here is 
um, one that I think is, is pretty important in the 21st century. Uh, for the first time in the history of education, the information, a lot of the content that the kids would be learning is already available to them. But they don't necessarily know where to find it. And when they do find it, they don't necessarily know how to make meaning out of it. And so teachers are probably more important than they ever have been. Regardless of what the media is saying and what all the new teacher evaluation plans are suggesting, teachers have never been more important than they are right now. Because they have to teach the students how to think critically, how to discern uh, what's right and what's good uh, about things that are on the Internet. Because what do our students do when we ask them to do research? They Google it. And then they take the first three things that pop up, and they turn that in as their research. We want to make sure that we're providing that level of depth. Um, and that means that we're inviting students into some of the design decisions that uh, we're making. Um, I've shared this story uh, before in, in professional development. I'm not sure if I've shared it in the webinar before. But um, on Twitter a couple of years ago, uh, one of my network members shared that he would ask his students um, how they thought they could demonstrate proficiency with a particular standard. He would tell them what the standard was, and he would invite their feedback about how they might demonstrate proficiency. And whatever ideas they had, if they had good ideas, he would work them into his curriculum design. And I thought that was a great way to approach it. I thought that was a great way to get the students involved, because if they're involved, then they're going to take it more seriously. They're going to have a higher level of buy-in, and that's going to create opportunities for, for middle Velcro. Things are going to stick if the students feel like their voices are being heard. So um, let's take a little pause right here. Um, I'm going to go back to the um, slide with the notice, think, and wonder. And I'd like for you, just as the audience that's out there, if you've got a question uh, right now, I just want to give you an opportunity to um, ask anything at the moment before I move on. Anything that's jumping out at you, uh, any connections that you're making, any questions that you have about the implications of what I'm sharing. So anything so far, Alicia? Um, we have a statement from Roger who says that... Right, I'm not seeing any... Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, we have a couple of comments that have come in, um, things that are jumping out, the students um, involve the students in the decision-making decision, decision -making process, um, the fact that we're already in the 21st century and so we can't prepare for something that we're already in. Um, when uh, Linda commented, I note that you talk about the learning objective that suggests that the norm for a classroom session is to have a single lesson objective. Um, and a question, why should student use of digital technologies be equivalent to that in school? In terms of the, what I was talking about with the technomeostasis, they, the kids live in this world um, outside of school um, you know, where they're, they're connected all the time. They've got multiple types of media coming at them. They don't necessarily uh, know what to discern as good information or what to connect as valuable information to connect. And I think that if we're, if we're creating um, these silos of tradition or maintaining these silos of tradition, in school that doesn't match what's happening in the outside world, then we're creating bubbles. We're creating time machines uh, where the kids have to step back into our zone in order to learn, where they've gotten used to a certain way of, of living outside of school. So I think the more that we can especially like multimediate the learning, not necessarily just use you know digital tools all the time, um, that's not what this is about. This is about making some uh, strategic digital replacements uh, that help what's going on that, well that um, show like how things are working in the outside world. Uh, we're looking to leverage that inside the school so that when the kids graduate, whether they're going on to college or whether they're going into their chosen career, they don't have to relearn a whole new set of skills that the outside world already has mastered that they didn't have an opportunity to do inside school. We need to get what's going on outside, inside. All right, 
so let's move on. I want to look at an example. And the example that we're going to look at uh, is from Michael Thornton's third grade science class at Meriwether Lewis Elementary School in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, <clears throat> Michael is on Twitter. His Twitter handle is uh, mthornton78. And I would encourage you to interact with him. He does a lot of really cool stuff with his students. And I'm going to share uh, one of these things uh, with you. In order to do that, I've got to leave the presentation and we're going to come out and go to the internet. Um, this presentation, I'm going to put, I'm going to drop the link inside the chat box to the live binder so that you can access it um, during this and navigate it with me if you'd like. Um, oh, that went to the organizer. So, uh, Alicia, if you could re-send that to um, everybody, that would be great. What you're looking at uh, is a live binder that Michael Thornton's third graders created uh, with his guidance, of course. Um, if we think about the college and career readiness capacities that are in the Common Core document, uh, right at the beginning, I think it's page five or six, the sixth capacity is students will be able to um, strategically and capably uh, use the Internet and digital tools. And so he's been kind of their digital coach here. And what he did was he told his students uh, what the science standard was that they were going to be investigating. And it's from the state of Virginia. That science standard is that students will investigate and understand basic patterns and cycles occurring in nature. Key concepts include patterns of natural events such as day and night, seasonal changes, simple phases of the moon and tides, animal life cycles, and plant life cycles. That's pretty heavy. There's a lot going on in that standard. So what Mr. Thornton did was he discussed what the standards meant uh, with his students. And then he asked them to do uh, some of their own research online uh, to find resources that the students thought were good resources to use for learning. Um, all of the resources that they collected, they collected in a Google Doc. And in order to use a particular resource, the student had to read through everything that was there and then had to write a statement of rationale about why that tool was a good tool to use for learning. And then the tool, the kids obviously broke this up. There's lots of different um, websites here that ultimately ended up being uh, part of their research process. All of these had some sort of statement of a rationale about why it would be good to include in a binder that represented resources to learn about this standard. So what you're seeing here are the rationalized, the justified, the discerned websites, um, all within these tabs. Life cycles, butterflies, frogs, moon phases, water cycle. Um, and then the last tab that's here says student created cycle quizzes. And this is actually a binder within a binder. And <clears throat> what you've got here are student created quizzes about whatever the, the tabs element is. So in terms of night and day or the water cycle or the frog cycle um, or the plant cycle, the students uh, with Mr. Thornton's uh, facilitation created their own quizzes. Now what's really cool about this is every time you create something in Google Forms, it creates a spreadsheet of, of data that was collected from that form. I don't have access to uh, that particular spreadsheet. but um, what he did after the fact was, after the kids took each other's quizzes, uh, Mr. Thornton, who is active on Twitter, um, put this out to his, his network and asked for people around the world to contribute uh, to these students' uh, assessments here, if you will. And so the, the person would potentially come on, read the information, take the quiz, and then he shows the kids the quiz, the, the spreadsheet of collected data. And they look at it and they analyze it for misconceptions. And as they look for misconceptions, they try to brainstorm why someone would think uh, that the, the misconceived version of the idea 
why they would have thought that, like what would have brought them to uh, not necessarily understanding it in the right way in terms of the science concept around the cycle. And that's how he taught these cycles uh, in, in accordance with this uh, Virginia standard. And I thought this was brilliant. Uh, this, this is what I'm talking about when I'm thinking about uh, digital replacements. We're replacing what we used to do in the classroom uh, with these digital tools. In this case, uh, the kids use both live binders as a tool of curation and then whatever they found through their research, likely through uh, Google or other um, search websites, collected them all here. Uh, created assessments. There's a lot of, of high-level learning here, I think. And so what I'd like to do is walk through the six cycles and assess what Mr. Thornton has done right here live and in the moment. So I'm not going to go back to the, the PowerPoint. I'm just going to do this uh, orally, uh, so hopefully you can stick with me. I'm going to go back through uh, the six steps, uh, starting with number one. What is the learning objective? The learning objective here is uh, pretty clear in terms of um, my conversation with, with Mr. Thornton and what he was hoping to achieve. The objective here is to, to demonstrate um, that learning has occurred uh, in relation to this standard. The student will investigate and understand basic patterns and cycles occurring in nature and then the rest of it around specific types of cycles. Did the students demonstrate that objective? Um, I believe they did, but not necessarily with the creation of the binder. I think it happened during the uh, moment that they started creating the assessments and taking each other's assessments and analyzing uh, the other assessment data from people outside their classroom. Uh, that's when the learning really happened. Um, some of that is going to be observational. Uh, some of that is going to be uh, specific and uh, depending on the data that was collected just from the students about what they learned uh, during these moments here. And even if we go back to the quizzes themselves, if we look at the specific questions, uh, especially at the constructed response questions, how does day and night relate to high tide and low tide? Why is there day and night on Earth? Why does the Earth circle the sun? Uh, depending on what kids write in there, if they're able to articulate their learning around these constructed response questions, um, I'm, I feel pretty confident uh, that they have learned, uh, at least at a proficient level, what this standard is asking for. In terms of step two, is the task worthy of a digital upgrade? What might this look like otherwise? Uh, books that Mr. Thornton would have potentially collected uh, maybe uh, some lectury things, some center type activities, and then some sort of written assessment on all of the cycles. Um, I think this gave the kids a lot of opportunities for finding their own resources and pushing them towards that strategic and capable use of the internet and digital tools. And this is not a one-time deal for Mr. Thornton. He regularly operates uh, this way, putting these digital tools in kids' uh, toolboxes. I absolutely think that this is an act of um, worthiness uh, in terms of a digital upgrade. Uh, it's not just, you know, collected Google research. The kids had to write a rationale for it, uh, which means that they're doing a different level of thinking than they would if he had just provided the materials in forms of, you know, short books or picture books. Uh, and then taking a test on the same information without all of this extra stuff that they've done, which leads us into step three. Will the digital tools increase or decrease the cognitive rigor of the task? Um, in terms of this, writing the rationale, the re that reflective element I think is pretty important um, because if a student is having to rationalize why they're including a particular resource, it's giving me information as a teacher about what it is they're taking away from that resource. So I absolutely think that there is uh, a cognitive shift up when we ask them to do that. Asking them to design the assessment um, is asking them to discern what the most relevant information would be to learn about uh, within these resources here. And then the deconstruction analysis of those assessments and uh, the discovery of any misconceptions 
that their peers or anyone else that contributed to this had, I think absolutely raises the thinking level here. Um, does the digital upgrade involve collaboration, communication, creative problem solving, or creative thinking? Uh, this is step number four. Um, the collaboration and communication, I definitely see the students work together for research. Uh, they communicated their reflections and their rationales uh, for what they've done here. Uh, in terms of creative problem solving, um, I'm not sure. I, I think that there are some elements here of critical thinking uh, where they had to discern the best resources, uh, where they analyzed you know, what happened at the end. Um, the creative problem solving, I'm not sure you know, how, how far we're going uh, with, with that here, except um, I don't know how much um, of the reins that Mr. Thornton relinquished in order for them to create the binder. If they didn't have a lot of help with that, uh, they might have had to have been creative um, about the way that they were designing this binder. I do notice that there's some color changes in here that they have. Uh, almost all of the tabs have sub-tabs. These are all multiple functions of live binders and not just the surface level zone. So either Mr. Thornton is being very um, strategic in his teaching of the tool along with the proficiency of the standard, or the kids figured it out themselves. They figured it out themselves and were also meeting that creative problem solving um, step. Um, in terms of number five, are sufficient digital tools available and do all students have access to them? That I don't know. Um, this looks, I mean, this is third grade. So um, I'm, I'm betting a large part of this was done at school. I do know that Live Binders is a tool that can be collaborative. Um, I don't know if Mr. Thornton shared uh, that level of collaboration with students to be able to work from home. Um, I don't know if there was any like after school time spent on this. Um, I just know that we have the product here, but we can certainly ask him, and I would, I would challenge you to do that um, on Twitter. Um, in terms of students involved in some of the decision making, absolutely. They decided what resources they were going to use. Um, they wrote the assessments. Um, so Mr. Thornton did give them um, <coughs> some of the choices here to help sort of create that mental Velcro and foster engagement. And when we have high engagement, we have high levels of learning. So before I move on, uh, let's go back to the binder for just a moment, or to the PowerPoint rather, uh, and just stop for just a second and look at uh, what are we noticed thinking and wondering about the six steps in terms of a specific example. So anything coming up in the question box, Alicia? Well, while um, they type their responses to the Notice, Think, and Wonder protocol, I did have a couple of questions about Live Binder specifically that I hope you might be able to quickly address. Um, sure. First off, is Live Binder a free resource? It absolutely is. Everything I'm sharing uh, with you today is a free resource or it's freemium, meaning that it has a free base service, and if you want more, um, a more dynamic service, you can pay for additional like layers of it. But the, the basic version of Live Binders is free. I use it all the time. Um, in fact, if, if I had my own favorite things show like Oprah and Ellen, that would be the thing that I would give away if it wasn't free, but it is, so I don't have to do that. Great. And how long did it take the students to complete this project? That I don't know, but I believe it was several weeks. Um... Um, one more uh, question, were the language standards embedded in learning experience such as grammar and spelling? Um, that I don't know in terms of Common Core, probably not because Virginia is not a Common Core state, but even with their own standards, they have analogs to um, the Common Core standards in terms of conventions. Um, I'm sure it's something that Mr. Thornton was aware of. Um, I did not specifically look, and while we were doing the webinar here right now, I didn't notice uh, anything. I did notice the word cycle was misspelled in one of the tabs, but uh, I don't know what kind of rubric he used to um, assess any of that um, outside of just observational analysis and discussion level events. Um, 
but that would certainly be something that we, we could you know, talk about in terms of an upgrade to this current project, just making sure that we're addressing other standards for writing and conventions. I think that would be a very good idea. Um, in your opinion, is LiveFinder user-friendly enough that it could be used for students younger than third grade? Um, I have a first grader at home, and with prompting and support, she can use it. Okay. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know that she lives with me, but um, you know, she. Whenever we're trying out digital tools, or if I'm going to use stuff with teachers, I try a lot of stuff out, you know, at home and with some of her uh, friends. And uh, she, she's able to use it. She. The, the main thing is just you know learning how to click, and learning what clicks do. And you know, she's very much used to like an iPad like touch environment. So anything that I give her to do that has an actual mouse. Uh, that needs to be used, you know, we've got a little bit of a, a learning curve there. Um, there are a couple of questions about assessment, but we can address those later if you'd prefer. Okay. All right. Um, so with our last few minutes here, I do want to still leave some time at the end for uh, some more global questions about the entire message that I'm sharing. But um, part of uh, what I'm sharing here is not just information about the, the book, the ARIA, but also an opportunity to give you a playground and a resource, uh, a 24-7 learning experience to play with from now on. So I'm going to come out of, oh, don't want to do that. I'm just going to come out of the um, presentation. And I want to go back to the internet and go to the um, live binder that I created for digital tools. This is also uh, in, in the book. There's an actual link in the book. I'm going to drop this in the chat box, Alicia, if you will uh, resend it out to uh, the group. This is the uh, live binder that I use uh, during professional development um, to give teachers just tons of tools, tons of opportunities, Lots of stuff to think about, and a lot of times I don't even use the PowerPoints anymore. I just present right from uh, the live binder, and this is it. And I want to show you a couple of things that are uh, in here. The way that a live binder works, it's like a bookshelf online. Each of these tabs here represent one shelf on the, the larger bookshelf, and within each of these shelves there are individual resources in the sub-tabs here. Um, each of these has to do uh, with, like, they would be analogous to books uh, on, on a bookshelf. So earlier I talked about integration and fusion and immersion. Uh, you've actually got the blog post here that, that you can read about. Um, if you're interested in having conversations with your peers and the folks that you uh, work with uh, at, in your school or in your role, uh, there are templates here for uh, assigning digital work. The questions are here and a place to take some notes. If you mouse over this, um, you should get uh, at the bottom opportunities to save it or to print it um, because it's a PDF. There's also a section on assessing. Um, so Alicia said there were some questions about assessment. I'll address those at the end. But um, there are some questions here related to what I wrote about in the book about um, assessing the digital work. And in terms of assessing, there are a couple of tabs that are specific to uh, that assessment, uh, including digital portfolios and rubrics. So there are two tabs here uh, that give you some resources for assessing those. The digital portfolios uh, is, is one of my more popular binders, uh, and this just gives you tons of stuff, pedagogy, um, tools, examples uh, of kids' works. Um, reflective analysis. There's a section here on rubrics. There's a lot of tools here for that as well. My favorite is the Quality Rubrics Wiki from uh, Learning Center Initiative uh, from uh, Jennifer Bennis and Giselle martin Kniep. The other stuff that's in here, this uh, the tab here that says Use What You've Got um, has to do with things that I already see in schools, such as PowerPoint, iMovie, Picasa, your interactive whiteboards. Uh, these are just resources for using those tools. There's a section here called New and Notable. These are some of the newer tools that are, you know, maybe a year or less old and include um, a web tool called Canva, 
uh, one that I just recently discovered here. It's a presentation tool uh, that's a lot like PowerPoint. It's not opening up in the binder, so let's open it up by itself. What I did was click the link in the binder um, just to pop that resource out of the binder. But Canva is a um, is a resource that you can use to, to make presentation. It has drag and drop functionality. Um, so if the kids are having to demonstrate learning through a digital presentation, uh, this might be a cool tool to use. Uh, likewise, Prezi might be a cool tool to use for a presentation. Um, just something, it's something other than PowerPoint. S'more is uh, a web tool that um, lets you create digital flyers. Um, I call these infographic light uh, because you get to create um, chunked up information with uh, visuals attached to it. And uh, I really think this would be uh, awesome for creating mental Velcro uh, with students. So lots of, lots of tools here to play with. EduClipper is like Pinterest, um, except that it's an educational version of Pinterest. So if Pinterest is blocked in your school, EduClipper might be uh, a good choice for you to use. If you are proficient with working Pinterest, you will have absolutely no trouble working EduClipper. Uh, Socrative, uh, one of the other tools here, this is all about assessment. You could use Socrative to collect um, objective data uh, in terms of multiple choice questions. It also allows for um, some constructed responses here, and kids can use any device. And uh, the teacher signs up for it, um, creates a class, and it's free. There are tutorials here for all of these newer tools. Under the Web 2.0 Tools section, there's a lot more tools to try out. Uh, there is a tab here for tutorials for a lot of the tools that are in the binder so that you can learn about these. So, you know, think about this as your virtual summer camp from now until school starts. There's a lot of things to play with, and I'm certainly not trying to overwhelm you with the amount of stuff that's out there, and I'd like to challenge you to, you know, just investigate one thing. Just, just try to get one thing going that you think would be useful for you and your students uh, and, and play with it. Um, I call this, in my workshops, I call this playing attention. So that's what I'd like to challenge you to do with uh, whatever's left of your summer. Play attention with, with some of the things that are in here. Uh, there are also collaborative tools um, that allow students to collaborate with each other, opportunities for global connections, including uh, let's see, where is it? Around the world in 80 schools. Uh, this is a website uh, that was created by uh, Sylvia Rosenthal-Tolsano. Uh, some of you may know her online as Languages. And this is a website where you can connect to schools all over the world. Um, I think there are well over 200 schools now involved. You can find teachers that are teaching the same thing that you are or the same grade level, the same content area and start figuring out uh, how you might interact on a global scale with each other's students, um, perhaps even collaboratively uh, creating some, some lessons and units uh, around how you can connect and what uh, each classroom's group of students, what kind of perspectives they could offer that your students wouldn't otherwise get. There's a section here with examples. Um, it includes uh, the third grade cycles from Michael Thornton. It also includes um, things like Prezi's. Uh, the most recent thing that I've put in here, these first these uh, first few examples are all high school examples, and then there's one in here called the Minecraft Research Product. And this is actually on ASCD Edge. I just blogged about it a couple of weeks ago. And what it is <coughs> is uh, somebody on Twitter, this Brent Coley, uh, that's a member of my digital uh, network shared a tweet that said, here's a great example of a fourth grade mission project created in Minecraft. And I did in the blog post exactly what I did with you just now. I go through and uh, look at this in terms of the six steps. This is also in relation to um, a couple of the common core standards around conducting short research projects to build knowledge and then um, using technology, including the internet, to produce and publish writing. 
So I lay out the six steps here, and then I went through them individually uh, to talk about uh, this particular video because I thought what this kid did was pretty cool. Um, so you can read about that. There are several other examples here uh, to read about in terms of student examples, and you can assess them yourself. Um, the last thing that I want to share with you uh, in the binder is the documents and resource section. Uh, this is its own live binder, which I'm going to pop out to make it a little bit easier to read. Uh, what's in here are documents related to uh, the professional development that I do with teachers. They're all free and open on the internet. You can print them. You can use them in your school. Um, there's a section here on digital learning strategies, and when I click on that, uh, the assigning template is here. The assessing template is here. And then there's another document here called GPS. This is a planning document that I use uh, with teachers um, called Goal, Process, and Success. Uh, if you think about those uh, triptychs that we used to get from AAA years ago, those of you that remember when AAA used to do that, um, those triptychs, if we wanted to go somewhere or go to uh, you know, some destination, it would lay out the destination for us uh, with the different roads that we could take and all the different like, side attractions that we could potentially take. And um, yeah, I thought it was a really good metaphor for curriculum design and curriculum mapping. And that's where this came from. Where is it that we want to go? What's your goal? What have you seen, observed, read about that you want to implement or upgrade, especially with, uh, in terms of digital replacements uh, in your instruction or in your assessment. And then what's your path? How are you going to get there? What's the process? What actions are you going to take in order to make those upgrades happen? Who's involved? What additional resources might you need? What groundwork must be laid? And then the success part is how you know you had a good trip. How are you going to know that what you've upgraded has made a difference? How will you prove what you intended to do? So between this live binder and the digital tools for assigning and assessing uh, digital work, you've got a lot here to play with after we're done. Um, this webinar is just a match, and hopefully uh, I've lit something that will burn for a while. I hope that you'll come back here and play attention uh, as often as you have time for. Um, but that is, I wanted to leave some time at the end. If we go back to uh, the presentation, uh, we've got one more checkpoint just to, just to think about this in terms of notice, think, and wonder. And let me kind of turn it back over to the audience and get a pulse of what you're thinking and what you'd like for me to address now that you've heard um, my take on digital learning strategies and how we assign and assess digital work. Alicia? Um, we've got some great feed, positive feedback about the resources you provided being very useful. Um, a question's come in, do you have any examples of digital projects for K to first grade? Uh, let's go look in the binder. Um, off the top of my head, there um, are some live binders. Uh, actually, let's just go to live binders for just a second. This will give me the opportunity to tell you about something else that I want people to stop doing. Um, I know that many of us get into a habit of Googling to find resources, and <clears throat> there's so many like social tools now and, and digital tools that are available online, and almost all of them have a search function. In this case, live binders uh, has this search binders button. If I open this up here, and I type in kindergarten. Um, here is a live binder for websites used by kindergarten students, um, and it tells me that it's had you know 6,800 views. So some some people have found this to be pretty valuable. It looks like um, games and sites, curriculum and activities. Um, now I'm not seeing anything that's a specific product. Um, there's something by M. Thornton. I wonder if that's our guy, if he helps some kindergarten students as well. Um, but apparently I have one in here as well. Let's look at what I've got. I have a lot of these binders. I create them everywhere I go. So uh, let's take a look at what's in here. So these look. this looks like fluency practice for math, because one of the things that um, I do with teachers is 
help them create digital centers uh, within LiveBinders. Um, and this is this is one of the examples of of that. Um, I can show you in um, the examples tab of the digital tools here. There's a tab in here called Cal's Story. Uh, Cal is a second grader uh, in North Carolina. I work with their teachers, and <clears throat> Story he he used a uh, web tool called Storybird uh, to do his writing. The, the objective was for him to be able to write a story and we just used a digital tool uh, to do that. And then I can go through and show you uh, what Cal wrote here. And this would certainly be appropriate for kindergarten and first grade students. Uh, they might need a little help initially learning how to operate the software, but it's also drag and drop and they can type. My daughter's been uh, doing this since she was five years old and now can do them on her own uh, at seven. But this gives us you know, quite a bit of information about Cal or any of the students that will potentially use this. Uh, you know, conventions are certainly an issue. His ability to tell a cohesive story from beginning to end is an issue. Uh, but because he's working in a digital tool, he can also go back and revise it. He has the opportunity to um, listen or get feedback from a global audience and not just his teacher. Uh, this first commenter here says, where it says the bear and monkey is throwing snowballs, the is should be are. So this is also an example of amplification of student work for the sake of global feedback. So Storybird might be a good one to use uh, with first and second grade students. There are a plethora of uh, tools that would help with uh, fluency practice in terms of math or uh, ELA, perhaps sight words, um, reading uh, short sentences, academic vocabulary. Um, those you could probably find by searching um, live binders for particular keywords such as fluency or a particular grade level or content area. So do you have any issues with parental consent in using online resources and publishing a minor's work? Um, it depends on the website and it depends on the school's um, rules. So I'm certainly not going to tell a school you know, to, to publish a kid's work if that's not part of their policy. I absolutely believe that it's necessary for kids to have a good digital footprint um, versus growing up and learning to access this stuff on their own and maybe not using it the, the right way. If the parents have a concern about the work being out there, all of these things like Storybird, Live Binders, um, even like EduClip or Pinterest, they can be privatized so that only you know someone with a link or someone with a password has access. Um, <coughs> that's all right. It's better if we can amplify it and get you know global feedback or share with other schools around the country or around the world. But I understand that you know steps need to be taken. We're not going to jump from integration to immersion in one fell swoop. Um, it's okay for some things to be integration level, some things to be infusion level, and other things to be immersion level, especially when the kids are young. So I don't have a problem with that. I would like to see it grow from that point. Uh, but if that's our entry point, then that's our entry point. Can you talk about how live binders are different from Wikispace? Uh, Wikispace is you're actually creating a, a website where you're creating a lot of content uh, on, on the page. In live binders, in most cases, you're just saving a live website into the, the frame. When I open this up to show you, these, um, this website this is an actual working website inside of the binder framework uh, versus a, a wiki. Let's go to a wiki and look at one. Um, I have a digital storytelling wiki called technotales.wikispaces.com. I'll drop that into the chat box so that uh, you can share it with the group, Alicia. The wiki is, um, I'm actually creating like a web page. Um, for each of these things, I, like on, on this page, I had to embed uh, videos. I wrote content, and each of these um, side navigation bars, I'm, I'm saving a lot of links here, but it's just the link. If this was the live binder, if this page was in a live binder, 
all of these would be their own tab. And when I clicked on the tab, it would open up a live web page. So I'm not clicking around uh, to see all these things. Just because I clicked the tab, they just open. And they open in, in a workable way inside the live binder. I can actually work this inside the live binder. So if we're thinking about uh, 21st century management, if you created virtual centers in live binders, it's always going to have this frame. So even across the room, uh, you'd be able to see if your students were staying on task. But yes, there is a difference. This is um, Live Binders is a tool of curation and collection, whereas the wiki is a tool of creation and publication, more like a, a proper website. Great. And what are some of the skills you think students need to know in order to be successful using digital tools? I don't think there's any one um, <clears throat> skill for the digital tools. I think it comes down to those four skills from p21.org. They have to be able to work together and collaborate. They have to be able to talk to each other uh, and communicate. They have to be able to solve problems creatively and think critically. So all of these new tools, a lot of the new tools that are online have similar functionality, and a lot of them are uh, like Prezi, just updated their, their format. Uh, and the way that they do things. So it's more drag and drop and it's more intuitive to the user so there's not a lot of stuff to have to learn. Um, something like Canva. When you start with Canva, and I'm logged in so it's not going to show me the start page. Let's log out and see if that helps. Um, you can connect with Facebook which means you'd have to be 13 years old. A lot of these have a, a 13 year old um, age requirement. It doesn't mean that a teacher couldn't use them uh, with students, but a student couldn't have their own account because there's issues with the Child Internet Protection Act uh, with uh, students having their own email because it, legally it's, it's a type of contract. But once you uh, connect for the first time, it walks you through, uh, I think this one calls it the 22nd tutorial, so that you can learn how to use the, um, the tool. And a lot of the tools work like that. They walk you through a tutorial first, and then a lot of them are just very intuitive now to use. The thing that matters, though, is that students have a lot of these tools in their toolbox so that when you as the teacher ask them to demonstrate their learning digitally, they make the choice about how they want to do that with digital tools. So it's not about everyone's going to blog. It's about everyone's going to demonstrate their learning around X, and you get to choose how you demonstrate it. In fact, in one of the examples here, um, it is the multi-step equations example. This is a Prezi, and this student, uh, Caroline, um, her teacher told her that you know, they could demonstrate multi-step equations by turning in the traditional homework, uh, or uh, she could turn in a Prezi. He did not teach the students how to do a Prezi. He just said, I found this really cool tool. It's called Prezi. If you want to create a Prezi for your homework instead of turning it in on paper, try it out and see what happens. And then she went through and created this presentation uh, where she articulated every step through the process of solving multi-step equations and I know I'm going through this fast, it's going to be hard for, for people to see, but um, at the end, she still has what the other students turned in. Here are all the steps, except the other students that created this on paper uh, didn't have uh, all of the written articulation of why they did what they did. This teacher knows a whole lot more about Caroline's process through the use of a digital tool uh, just by throwing it in her toolbox, seeing what happens. So that's the power. That's the power of this. Lots of tools that kids choose. Um, did I answer the question, or did I go off in the left field? You absolutely <laughs> answered the question. Um, uh, it is also uh, four o'clock now. So if you have any closing remarks, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Okay. Just that if you want to interact with me on Twitter, it's at Fisher1000. My website is digigaji.com. Um, I'd like to thank ASCD and Alicia specifically for hosting for Adobe Presenter. Uh, for uh, being the vehicle uh, for us to be immersed in uh, digital learning. And I thank you all very much for sharing your afternoon with me. Mike Fisher's ASCD ARIA's book, Digital Learning Strategies, is available in the ASCD store. 
visit shop.ascd.org and search for the author's name to purchase.